Registry Matters is an independent production. The opinions and ideas here are that of the hosts and do not reflect the opinions of any other organization. If you have a problem with these thoughts, FYP. Recording live from FYP Studios East and West, transmitting across the internet, this is episode 144 of Registry Matters. Larry, that's a, that's a, a prime number, not a prime number, what's a, a, a cube number, square number. 12 times 12 is 144. We've reached it, man. We can shut it down after this. Sounds like a good plan to me. Great. Great. All right. Take care. Good night. Talk to you soon. You know, I, I'm pretty excited, though. Um, I haven't spoken to you all week. Really? How about that? <laughs> oh. First time I talked to you all week. I guess you called me yesterday. That was like a whole week. I was like, ah, it's a vacation. No, I didn't even call you. The first time we spoke this week, it was today. Are you sure? Sure it wasn't yesterday? Yep. Nope, didn't talk to you yesterday. Okay, well then it sounded, it felt like, so you, hey, I even had an extra day and I didn't even realize it. Fantastic, love it. So, so, so play that one more time? Uh, I can do it one more time. <laughs> Will and Chad is all like, man, that's great music, because you know, that's what he listens to when he <laughs> is rocking out at home. He's listening to some, some hardcore rock and elevator music, because that's what Will does. Mm-hmm. We have oh. a interesting program tonight, Larry. I'm looking forward to what we got going on. What well, do let's think? do it. All I right. think it's going to be exciting. We've, we've gone through and cut down from uh, 20, 25 articles down to just a handful. So we got, uh, we got some news items. We are going to uh, go rehash the AWA segment that we covered four episodes ago. And then we have some listener questions. We got new patrons. Great, great full program that we have going. Uh, but let's uh, let's start off here. We've got a uh, an article from Reason Magazine. Cops use pictures of adult women to trick men into meeting for sex and then arrest them as child predators. I know that we've covered this before, but boy, does it keep coming around. This is from Lenore Skenazy, who uh, she has presented at Narsal conferences before. And it's uh, going into the details of how that you get people to... Uh, they do a bait and switch like, Hey, I'm 23 years old. They meet them on maybe like a Craigslist kind of page. And then they switch midstream in the conversation and say, Oh, well, maybe I'm like 13. And then when you show up, it's an adult cop. Who's the victim, Larry? Well, this has been a, this has been a a beef of mine for some time because, uh, and I really appreciate Lenore and the work that she does, but, uh, but this is, uh, this is an imaginary crime. Right. And, and, it, it's one of those things where when we talk about, as the way the conservatives pitch it, defunding the police, Right. this is one of the things where if you reduced funding, which is what people are actually talking about rather than defunding, if you reduce funding, they wouldn't have the human capital to do these type of operations because there's actually no one actually solicits a minor for sex in real life in, in terms of it being a real minor. Of all the years I've been doing this, involved in this advocacy, I think I've seen it once. This is all an invention of law enforcement creating a problem. It's a solution in search of a problem. They changed the statutes and they made the the punishment more severe than if you actually have contact sex. And they, they sit around and they do everything they can to trick these people into committing a crime that they had no intention of committing. They were not in any any environment looking for minors, and this is just it, it's it's disgusting. I mean, I don't I don't know of any other way to describe it. And if you cut back on police funding, they would probably have to choose to cut back on some of these uh, some of these programs that they have. This would be one that I'd like to see go. There's a there's a couple paragraphs in there where they're describing that I I don't know I didn't read it that carefully like the Operation Underground Railroad. Our, as it is called, donated more than $170,000 to the Washington police to support these stings. These funds paid for additional detectives, hotels, food, and overtime. Seemingly in return, the police helped the organization reap positive publicity. And of course, the more predators the cops catch, the more people are eager to donate to an organization focused on this scourge. Arr! So, like, this is policing for profit almost. Almost, but 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 the lives it ruins and the cost 
we can't just look at the at the cost of this operation in terms of what it cost. We have to look at the societal cost. We've got a 20 year old that's talking about in this article named Jack uh, Hambrick, uh, a young man. So he's got 50 years of, of, of possible work a career ahead of him, yeah. paying taxes and being a productive citizen. We just took that all away from him. Yeah. And we, we, we hurt society by doing that because all of us who have our paws out wanting to collect, we won't be able to collect nearly as much. The more we do this to people, they can't pay because they're either in prison or they're in dead end jobs. And I don't know when people are going to wake up to that, that we need people producing at their optimal level. So that those of us who think that it's our turn to collect, we can collect from those donations that they're making. And we've, we've got the cost of his incarceration. Then we've got the cost of, of lost productivity. For what? What did we gain from this? We gained a person, well, I should say we gamed a person into committing a crime that, that he had no intention of committing and, and and we are really proud of ourselves. You should be ashamed of yourselves. Is what you should be. The uh, the person you're referencing, if I'm looking at the right person, he was sentenced to 18 months to life and a minimum of 10 years on the registry. So, but That's his life crazy. is his life is uh, unless the laws change in terms of being able to eradicate this history, his life is all, in all actuality damaged beyond repair will he be able to pull himself up by his bootstraps maybe <laughs> will he be able will he will he be able to exist maybe but we've made it the barriers significant because we're having fun to do something to, to arrest people for crimes that are not committed yeah well yeah so there it is the reason magazine that's lenore skenazy and uh, we don't really need to dwell on that one that long but this one is a uh, great news over at the washington post we've covered this guy curtis flowers will finally be freed prosecutorial misconduct remains a problem however but this is a cat that was in 96 con or at least try i guess and yeah convicted of quadruple homicide and then through six trials i think it was and just massive prosecutorial misconduct bias in the jury he keeps going back to trial and then finally i think that the uh, the supreme court finally stepped in and said there's enough going on here that you probably shouldn't try this guy again and he's going to get out soon ish maybe he's already out i think he's already out but uh, this is six prosecutions and hmm. six convictions they sanitized the jury and i did a little research uh the the community is roughly 50 50 between black and white but they used the, the state used their peremptory challenges to make sure there were no African Americans on the jury, and and the the county, if I'm not mistaken, at the towards the end of it, the uh, they say that it's it's not quite a fifty fifty split as far as the uh, the jury close to or, it or the close, the demographics close to it yeah forty four percent I believe it was so why would it be so hard to come up with a jury that is at least closer representative of the population of the area? Well, it wouldn't be that hard. They did not want to. That was the whole point of, of one of the appellate points. The, the prosecution used their preemptory challenges to strike any black that would have been uh, considered for jury duty. Because in a, in, in a, like you, have, you have challenges you can utilize for no reason at all. And they used their preemptory challenges to do that. Tell me, uh, there was a Supreme Court case. I'm, I'm, you've, you've mentioned the name before that... Uh, this got brought all the way to the Supreme Court, and they ruled maybe in the 80s? I think it starts with a B? Batson. Batson. Very good. Man, you're the man. And can you describe Batson real quick? If Hopefully you can. Uh, well, I'm not, not prepared, but I remember there was a, there, there, it, was, it dealt with, with, with summarily excluding um, minority jurors, and, and the state can't do that anymore. Okay. But but they did, they did it for a long, long time. And, and just... Just because the person has the skin color of what you don't want, you just say, like, that's your reason. But now they, they have, a, did you, you may have seen the movie Runaway Jury, I believe. It has an actor named John Cusack. I have and, not. Okay, and it's also got Gene Hackman. And when, like, there's this whole war room thing going on where it's big, big high-profile case. And they have 
all of the background, all of the, you know, everything that you could find about a person that's going to be on a jury and they're relaying information into the courtroom on who they would want to keep and who they would not want to keep. I have no, no concept of whether this would be real or not, maybe for something like an OJ kind of trial, not for something in your local, local county, whatever, but like big deal of having some sort of strategist of jury strategist, maybe is that, is that a fair position for someone to have? Well, I'm not sure I'm understanding your question, but 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 uh, jury selection is 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 a significant part of strategy if you're going to go to trial. Okay, right, right. Uh, so, right. would would a high profile case would there be like a whole team of people doing background checks on the potential jurors? Well, if, if there's the money there, if okay. if, if yeah, the yeah, high yeah. profile case has 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 the money, we don't always make the resources available to. To people who who need them, but in, in a case like with OJ, yes, there would have been extensive work work done in terms of jury selection, uh, demographics, and, and uh, you would had to have a huge pool to pick from because there's so much publicity. There would be so many people who'd be dropped just because they they would not be able to even pretend they could be neutral and and, and unbiased. But this Batson case has to do with just using your challenge without cause. You simply say that juror is not acceptable. Each side has so many peremptory challenges, and that's what they did in, in this guy's case. They used their peremptory challenges to get rid of, of, of minority jurors. Doesn't sound fair at all. It doesn't sound like, uh, uh, would you then appease me and give me a valid reason why you would just say, I don't like that person, not for racial reasons? I mean, I, I know we can come up with all kinds of reasons why they wouldn't qualify, but it seems like everyone should qualify for jury duty. But you might not like, you know, you might feel like based on their background that you don't feel like they could be fair. Would you want 12 police officers sitting on a jury that, that, that you were facing trial? I mean, honestly, that I don't think unfair. you would say you could. I don't think you could believe that they could be unfair. So you would, you, I mean, be unbiased. You would, you would not. So there, when, you, when, you're, when you're trying to, when you're hoping for a mistrial, you, you may go into trial because your client wants to go to trial and you know that the evidence is overwhelming and you're looking for who's that magic person that can provide you the hope of a mistrial in a hung jury? And, well, if you put 12 officers, most most jury consultants would tell you that the officers are not going to look for ways to acquit people. They're going to look for ways to, to convict people. So of that course. would be an example. That would be an example of, of somebody you would just exclude. If, you have a, if you've got six peremptory challenges and – a, a, a law enforcement officer pops up on on, on the radar. So I'm not going to even go bother to ask this person any questions. We don't want that person. Yeah, uh, and it wouldn't have to be a law enforcement officer. It could be a former prosecutor. It could be any number of yeah. things that you that you don't feel. Like, you know, in, in a civil case, it could be someone who had who had ties to the industry, and you wouldn't think they could be fair to your client who was suing that industry. So there, there'd be valid reasons for excluding people. But but in Batson, they did it simply on 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 race, and and the Supreme Court said you couldn't do that. And that was way back in 1986. I just pulled it up. Okay, very good. And then we will. Uh bounce back over to reason it says the title is bust police unions they're a consistent force of organized resistance to calmer safer less aggressive policing the only thing that really jumped out at me i've been i've been listening to a bunch of podcasts and things that cover this subject it to me it sounds like police unions are a significant challenge in us having any sort of anything as far as policing reform but the guy that oh the the first gun uh, the first police officer that was at parkland that uh, responded to the scene that everyone then went and nuts over because he didn't do anything. Uh, he actually got his job back and all the back pay. I thought that was, and that was all because of the police union. And I don't want to get into whether he justified firing, justified not going in the, I'm not trying to go into that, but he got his job back and all the back pay that he was owed. Well, that's quite common. The outcome when, when people, uh, when you try to, to, when you try to address police misconduct, the the union comes in and, and I'm I'm pro union I, I make no bones about that uh, this country is a lot better off because of organized labor and, and what what has been contributed by organized labor but in the process of being pro union I've also been able to recognize that unions sometimes are not <laughs> they're not the solution to a problem uh, that sometimes they create problems and and in a case of 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 the police unions I find it ironic that as conservatives go, they normally don't like unions, but yet magically the police union is just adorable to most conservatives, and, and right. I, I can't I can't figure out what what makes that 
distinction. The police unions do everything that private sector unions do. They try to make sure that their people keep their jobs. They try to, to negotiate for the best benefit packages they can get, the best working conditions they can get, the best retirement plans they can possibly get, the best health care plans they can possibly get. They do all those things on behalf of police officers, and yet somehow that is appreciated by people who normally don't like unions. But back to this, to this, to this particular case here, that typically, as I've observed what happens when police are discharged or disciplined, it's, it's often overturned on appeal. It, it, the, the, the process of discipline is overturned, and the unions, I know they're squawking here in my state, they're squawking here at APD about how horrible that these reform efforts are that the DOJ and the city agreed to uh, four or five years ago. They, they, they're saying how it's just inhibiting their work. And how that, that it's just, it, it, and the unions are constantly saying that if you just let us do what we do, we know what to do best. Well, yes, really? Then why are you killing and choking so many people? Why are you doing all these things if you know what's best? We right. we tried it. We tried it your way. It's very strange to me. I. <laughs> I, I know that you're pro union and I can see, you know, we, we, I can, I can see that's legit that we would want them to have a, a good benefits package. But then when someone gets fired for some, you know, Eric Gardner kind of thing, like that person might not be, shouldn't be, he shouldn't be in public enforcement. Maybe he would be filing paperwork and whatnot, but like, it doesn't seem like that would be the right person to have in the public sphere. Well, I've had that discussion all my life since I was an adult. I worked in a grocery company that was union. And some of these problems I was able to observe as a youngster, I would see people that were slackers. And then when management attempted to deal with the slacker, I would, I would see the union come running, which is what we paid our dues for. That's exactly what they're supposed to do. They were supposed to come running and make sure that the uh, co company's uh, contractual obligations were followed and that due process was was followed. But I would I would I would see I recall instances where management just threw up their hands and said, "There's nothing we can do about it. You know, we 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 can't we can't get rid of that person." And it's always amazed me that the police officers say that 95, 98, 99, whatever their percentage is, all of us are wonderful people, and we're doing a good job, and we're following the rules. It's, it's baffled me as to why they stand back and let bad people be mixed among them. It would seem like to me you would want the bad apple gone in order for the community to see how the 99% or whatever that percentage is, is doing a wonderful job. I don't understand the blue wall of silence. I don't right. understand try, trying to keep a bad one among you. You would want to ferret those out, I would think. And I said that I, when I was when I was at a union job, we don't want bad people here. I I, th I think the answer then is with the blue wall of silence that, the, that it would then let corruption just run rampant and take bribes and so forth. If you have that blue wall of silence, and then just everyone is complicit in not reporting on each other, whether someone's on the take or someone does something dirty, and then everyone's just it's a it's a, it's a you know it's a mafia, it's a gang. So, well. I would sure like for some of our listeners to explain it to me why police unions are good and private sector unions are bad, because they do right. the exact same say, the exact same thing. You're doing your your goal is to do the exact same thing, which is to provide the best compensation, best benefits package, the best retirement package, the best working conditions. All those things are part of what unions do, and to provide due process for discipline. and And I don't understand why you can be a union hater, how you can be a union hater. And be a union lover. I do understand, Larry. Let's move <laughs> over. Let's uh, let's let's circle back to episode. I think you told me it's one forty, and uh, about the new proposed AWA regulations that got everyone's hackles all up all up in air. And uh, so I I have prepared expertly and meticulously. I have prepared a bunch of questions for you that I thought we could uh, go over and try and help people resolve their fears or extend their fears. Well, I don't know which one it's going to do. <laughs> right. All right. So are you ready to go? I'm doing my best. Okay. I'm, we, we I'm, op get, I'm, op I'm, op I'm opening my cheat sheet, but it's not opening. Now, isn't that funny? Oh, 
That is terribly funny. Well, um, I'm sure you can answer this one right off the bat. So it's like several people, we, we did get a bunch of email and comments from people about the proposed regulations. People have, have messaged me privately about it. And uh, so what is what is the AWA? Can we like cover like the quick 10 second, 30 second history of what the AWA is to begin with? Well, the AWA is a congressional act passed in 2006, Adam Walsh Act. And it was signed by President, then President Bush, and it it recommended to the states that they that they improve the efficacy of their existing registries, and it gave a three year compliance period for substantial uh, implementation. And at the end of that three year period, the states who had not substantially implemented the recommendations faced uh, a ten percent loss of their burn justice grant funding and that that's what the awa is there's a component in there called sorna and we talk about sorna as if federal is the only that has sorna but every state has something that resembles sorna they may call it sora they may call it something else but but when we when we hear sorna for purposes of this discussion tonight we're talking about federal sorna all right, and the attorney general has proposed something. What what did he propose to do? This is William Barr. This isn't from a previous administration, is it? This is the current administration. That is correct. The, so, what has the current administration proposed to do? Well, the the they have proposed under under the regulatory framework the the Congress delegated to the Department of Justice to to promulgate regulations, which they've done. Uh, uh, ten years ago or so, they they promulgated the regulations. Uh, the the interim rules, and they promul uh, they promulgated regulations of how to implement what the states would need to do. They've discovered in the intervening more than ten years after promulgating those rules that that a significant number of states have not been able to achieve substantial compliance. They've gone back to the drawing boards and they've looked at a way to make it. Their whole goal is, if you understand their whole goal, is to have more states come into compliance. So they put their collective brains together and they came up with a way to try to adapt the regulatory framework to make it easier for states to comply. And that's what they've done. They've put out a new proposed regulatory uh, framework. Riddle me this, though. Why, like, if all of the, the state highway systems don't fit the same thing, why, why does the federal government even care to the degree of compliance that there is. Well, this this had at the time in 2006, there were 50 state registries. They all had registries. Some of the states barely communicate with each other, and when they when they passed this, they were attempting to address a real problem. There had been lax enforcement because the state that the person was registered in who left was happy that they left, and the state that they had gone to didn't know they were there. And therefore, it was it was purported that 100,000 of approximately 500,000 registrants at that time were off the grid. So as a matter of national policy, the, the, the Congress said, we can't have this. We told, we asked the states to create these registries back a, a decade earlier, in 94, when they passed the Jacob Wetterling Act, and we've got 50 registries that barely communicate with one another, and we've got 100,000 people off the grid, and that's not in the public interest. So they they set about trying to figure out a way to have more uniformity and consistency in how the states operate their registries. Okay. Um, and moving into this, so the Attorney General proposed some, uh, asked for comments, and what is the point of having a 60-day comment period? That's a good question. And what the comment period does is, is it's primarily for the purpose of expressing that the, that the law that was enacted, that, that the regulations are attempting to implement, that they're either exceeding the law or they have not accommodated the law. And, and that's the purpose of the comment period. So the stakeholders, theoretically, if you were, if this were an EPA regulation, the stakeholders that would be subject to the EPA regulation would have the opportunity to look at what Congress did, and they would have a chance to look at the proposed regulation. Uh, 
And they would have a chance to say, well, no, actually, Congress didn't want that. They actually wanted this, and you didn't do that, and this is going to be the, the adverse impact of that. Therefore, this is going to drive us out of business or whatever. That's the purpose of the comment period. But what our people think, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an opportunity to redebate sex offender registration. That debate was already had. It's I was just about had to ask you about that. <laughs> it's already been had twice now in terms of the Jacob Wetterling Act and the Adam Walsh Act. We've, as a matter of national policy, we want our states to have sex offender registries. So if you're going to debate the efficacy of sex offender registration, this is not the forum to do that. Because uh, for, for my stupid person understanding, there, my, my big issue for, for our people is residency restrictions because that seems to be like the biggest barrier and then also work restrictions on top of that. That's not part of the AWA or the Jacob Wetterling Act. That is correct. That is one of the so, many things that, that they get yeah, yeah, blamed no, of for. Of course. I, like, but if, if someone wants to live somewhere, like, I, it just would create all kinds of problems. Anyway, so if someone wants to bitch and moan about residency restrictions and they would go on here and complain about this, they're barking up the wrong tree because it doesn't apply. That is at your state where Alabama has 2,500 feet, Georgia has 1,000 feet, et cetera. That, that would be correct. But be even beyond that, if you don't like the registry itself, the fact that we register offenders convicted of sexual crimes, this is not the venue to have that discussion. These are bureaucrats who work for the Department of Justice who have been tasked with carrying out the will of the American people as expressed through their through their elected representatives and senators and signed into law by the president at the time bush and this is not the place for that discussion and that's what people are tempted to want to do they want to say well the registry doesn't work well that's nice but that these people can't do anything about that whether it works or not i was, I was let me let me make another stupid person analogy you get pulled over by the cops for speeding running red light and you want to argue with them about well this is stupid it shouldn't be that way look he's only there to execute what the law already said you're, you have no reason to debate with the person about him executing his duty. William Barr is the executive of the judicial branch, but he's part of the executive branch. That, that is correct. And that was a, uh, an analogy about the if you're, if you're going down a, a, a highway where the speed limit, in your view, should be 70 and it's 45. The officer didn't set that at 45. Right. So your beef so, about it should, should be 70 is not with the officer. Yeah, and is then what would what would be a valid comment? Can can you posit what a, a, a an acceptable, a rational comment, a realistic comment would be for the sixty day period? Well, uh, I know you've read all ninety three pages with a fine tooth comb, right? Without a doubt, absolutely. It's, it's sitting by my. It's on my nightstand by my bed. I I, I kind of glance at it as I'm going to sleep. <laughs> well. I mean, you can make any comment you want in of terms of, of your right. But what would be a valid comment, and we're struggling with this because as I've done a, a less than thorough analysis of the 93 pages, what I see is merely a reflection of the will of the Congress. The will of the Congress and the will of the American people, the will of the Congress was a result of the will of the American people who were calling and griping about the 100,000 missing sex offenders, and we got to do something. And the Bill O'Reilly factor that went on and on and on about it in 2006, bashing Ted Kennedy for, for filibustering, all that stuff. This, this is a reflection of the American people. But what a, what a valid comment would be, would be if there was something being done that was not the will of Congress. If you, if you, if you put a proposed regulation, and I guess we would we, be able to give an example of what happened in Maryland. When, when Maryland passed their version of AWA back in 2010, uh, they, the, the same process took place. They, they, passed, they passed their law, and then the, the uh, a regular, regulatory directive was given to the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services, I believe, to, to drop the regulations to implement it. And they drew up regulations that exceeded what the uh, what the Maryland le legislature had done. They put in some additional things that they thought would be good measure. They put in uh, that that uh, 
local law enforcement unit, as they call it in Maryland, shall continuously check on an offender. And I, I may not have the word exactly right, but that's about what I remember it saying. I, I helped draft the, the comments that the Maryland Fair put in. And we were successful. They they pulled those regulations, but but you put they put things in that weren't were in the act that the legislature passed, and we pointed to those specifics. I think the twenty one day advance notice might have been another one for international travel. I don't think that was in the uh, the, the Maryland law as they passed it, and the the people that wrote the regulations, they looked at the AWA and they said, well, the 21 day notice is in there and, and, and clearly we should be checking on these offenders. So they put in there that, that those uh, things of that nature, but that wasn't actually in the law. So we put in the comments, sorry, you can't go that far because the legislature, had they wanted that, they would have said that. And then we set about on a sabotage campaign. We contacted all 23 counties in Maryland. We contacted the county attorneys of those counties and we said, guess what? When you when you look at this regulation, your law enforcement people are required to continuously check on these offenders, and let us tell you what's going to happen when when one of them inevitably reoffends, and the first thing that the 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 attorney is seeking recompense from the from the county is going to ask is where where is your log of how often they checked, and and if they reoffended, obviously they didn't check quite often enough, right? Sure. That would be that would be the argument you would make if if they checked every thirty days, you would you would argue as a plaintiff's attorney you would say well they if they had checked every ten days this might not have happened, right. so we we use that to scare them that 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 they were on the hook so we we did that with county attorneys county commissioners we had a team of people thanks to the leadership of Brenda and her her brilliance and coordinating a team of people we put we put the pressure on the counties they came to the table. They showed up at the hearing because under Maryland law, there's a process to have a legislative oversight of these of when a, when a regulatory proposal is put forward and there are some significant, some significant issues raised, they can convene a hearing with a legislative committee and they such a committee uh, a hearing was convened and they decided after hearing from the parties that the that the that they had gone too far. And uh, 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 I think it was Senator Broshan told them unequivocally, if we had wanted that in the, the legislation, we would have done that. It's not for you to do that. Translation, if we can find something in these 93 pages that they have put in there that was not the will of Congress, then we have something to hang our hat on. Not is liking any- it is, is not enough. Okay, Um is anything about the tier notification stuff? Is that something to? I'm I'm trying to come up with some other kind of example to, to to see about because like the 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 federal SORNA guidelines thing is it's worded different than what people end up with on their internet publication side of things as far as how they uh, rank people on the tiers. I think. Well, I'm I'm confused by that question. Okay, then never mind. Do do you want to bring Brenda on? Well, if she's if she's raised her hand, if she has anything uh, anything that she'd like to say, but that's that would be an example. Now, there are political strategies that can be utilized, and 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 in fact, Brenda, I, Brenda and I talked about that earlier today. What you might want to do is a political strategy, and it's a really really long shot because conservatives magically do an about face on a lot of things, and this would be one where they would likely to do it. And, and what we can do is we can take a look at things like real ID which is another mandate by conservative Congress passed in 2005, signed by President Bush, requiring the states to totally revamp how they issue identification. Again, there is no national ID card like there's no national registry. The states issue both ID and driver's licenses. And they told the states, we want you to have IDs that have these features, and I'm not a security expert, but there are certain things in, in the ID itself that they want it to have, and they want to have source documents. Even though you're 50, 60, 70 years old and you've, you've already proven who you are, they want you to capture the source documents all over again. So after I go in on my next trip in to get my license, if I want a real ID compliant, I have to take in my birth certificate that I took in 50 years ago and have it scanned into a big old federal database. So that that all the 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 identification issuers across the country can access that database. Now, normally conservatives are dead set against big old federal databases, 
But magically, they did a flip-flop on that one, and they think it's a wonderful thing. The point I'm making is that if we could get someone to be true to their values, who claim that they believe in federalism, that they believe in uh, not pushing unfunded mandates on the states, if there's a core of conservatives like the, 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 the six or eight in the Senate that were led by Tom Cotton that gutted the First Step Act, if we could find a core of true believers, and a, an example would be like Rand Paul, he's consistently good about defending fiscal responsibility and, uh, and not running huge deficits. And even to, 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 the, uh, to the surprise of his constituents, he says, we, we can't be doing what we're doing. If we could find that group of people in the Congress and, and at the state levels, and not just in Congress, but at the state levels, and we could go to those people at our, in those states and say, look, you need to weigh in on this because these regulations are about to be adopted. And guess what? You're going to have to pay for registries, registrations for many, many years beyond what we require in this state because there's a federal duty to register. And it looks like they're trying to power grab uh, that, that, the, that the, this that the president administration is trying to uniform the periods of registration. And we're all of a sudden going to have to carry and track these people for 25 years or life. And if you could tr- have some true believers and they would submit their comments, we might could have some impact if the states would weigh in and say, we don't want to register people for these long periods of time. But barring Wouldn't that, be that an unfunded mandate? Absolutely. But the conservatives will be OK with it. That's what I'm telling you. They do a flip flop on th- certain things. And this is one. I know, where but I've we've talked them. about that from like the state level. And then they put it down to the county level for them to do the registration. It's an unfunded mandate at the county level that they do the registration stuff. And I'd never made the connection that this would be a federal uh, yes. mandate down to the state level if yes. the state only has five years of registration in this st- i don't know what the awa says but so they would say well you're going to register these people for x even though you were only doing it for y that is correct but i'm telling you that i've been around our legislature for 30 years and the people who profess what you're talking about about unfunded mandates they magically do a chameleon switch when it comes to this and they're okay with unfunded mandates that they like and this is one where we would need a true, true believer that doesn't flip flop on something when it when it when it's a law enforcement thing. And if we could find that core of people, we would make the appeal to them like we did in Maryland. And 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 if they would put in comments saying, on behalf of my state, I don't want this because I don't we don't want to be carrying people on our registration list for the the, the minimum period is fifteen. And 25 in life, and the 15 can be reduced on tier one to to, tw- to 10 years, but but in most ca- cases it's either going to be 25 or life because most sex offenses are at least a felony. That's going to put you in the 25 year category, and then depending on the age and some other factors, they could be a lifetime obligation. And there are states who who are not carrying people anywhere near that long presently, and this is this is to, has the potential the potential to cause that to happen. So, uh, so back to the the comment section. The unfunded mandate might be a decent comment to go post. Well, it's going to be more powerful if, if like, when Maryland, we didn't we didn't have all the power ourselves. We had counties coming in saying we don't like this because we don't want to be responsible for not checking on these offenders frequently enough. We, I got gotcha. you. We, we, we don't need the offenders to say that the cost is, is too much. Nobody cares about that, what you think about the cost. But what we need is the state of Vermont to come in and say, we have no interest in carrying people for these long periods of time. This, the, oh, the, gotcha. the, the, this, this, is, this is too much. That might be a strategy, but we need conservatives who will not flip on us and who will actually say, I believe in federalism, and this is this is a direct attack on federalism. The states get to decide how long they register people, or if they register them at all. And and that's that's where I'm afraid that that's such a long shot because I think that although it's wishful thinking, I think it's really a, a extreme long shot that we can actually find people that'll that'll do that. I mean, remember the Michelle Bach? Ba- uh, how do you pronounce her name? Bachman. Bachman? 
from from 2016 she was one of those who claimed she believed so much in in, in, in states rights and on the debate stage before she got knocked out of the, of the, of the campaign the the, the the same sex marriage was was being discussed and she says absolutely i believe in state rights that they can <laughs> that they can that they can decide who gets married but she said i also believe that the federal government can come in and using the supremacy clause and that the federal government can define what a marriage is and this federal government should do that and that's how they do you know they magically flip if it's something they don't agree with, that all of a sudden what they claim that they agreed with, they flip away from it and they say it's something different. But if we could find some true believers, now, our audience is filled with a lot of conservatives. If you can, if you know somebody in your state legislature, that's what you need to be doing. You need to be reaching out to that person and say you've been a big proponent of federalism and allowing the states to run their own show. How do you feel about? The, the 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 bar administration trying to federalize registration of sexual offenders and i and i'm just about bet you you're going to, well that's such an important issue for public safety i think that i can go along with you remember when we had we had king alexander on and he said that we needed a federal we you remember when i chided him i said what do you mean king of all people you're, <laughs> you, do you remember do you remember that i do Yes, well, well, that's what they do. They magically do a flip on you, and that's what they're likely to do. But at least we can try. And then I guess the the one of the remaining questions is: Haven't most states re- rejected implementing full AWA? No, they have not. All right. Well, some states, uh, Pennsylvania, as an example, will list somebody's work address. I think that's part of AWA, where Georgia doesn't list where you work. So, well, well, that's one of the confusing things about that. When you look at the list of compliant states and it's smaller than the list of non-compliant, you automatically say, well, this, they've rejected it. No, they haven't rejected it. They have been unable to comply because they've been trying to go through the legislative process to do like Maryland and Pennsylvania and all these states that have put forth a comprehensive bill and got it enacted. And they've not been able to because there's been pushback, particularly from the juvenile justice advocates. And they've not they've not been able to achieve substantial compliance because it's complicated stuff. Trying to put the package together, go down the smart office's checklist of things you need to do, you end you end up not not achieving a key, a key component. And and but but the states have not renounced it. They are trying to comply. They're wishing that they were compliant. They're hoping to be compliant. And that's what makes that gives people the, the fact that, that more states are non-compliant gives people this false sense of security that, well, since my state has rejected it, I don't have to worry about anything. Your state hasn't rejected it. There's only a couple of states who have just said we have no interest in it. I think Texas and maybe California said we have no interest. But the majority of the states are doing everything they can. And even Texas, although they said they didn't want to comply, the funny thing is Texas is already more extreme than what the AWA would be. It would actually be an improvement if Texas did comply. If they if they actually peeled back okay. the requirements to be to right. be uh, <laughs> yes 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 I'm with you I'm with you yeah so so what, do just what's required not not go the extra mile and and it, the if the situation overall would be improved. Well, and same thing in California. The, 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 right. They had lifetime for everybody. This is the AWA doesn't require lifetime for everybody. Wouldn't it be an improvement? for the people who no longer had lifetime obligations i mean can you can you honestly say it wouldn't be an improvement for those people it probably would be well i don't know anybody who wants to stay on for life of all the people i've met i've never had anybody say well i kind of like it so much i'd like to be uh, registered for life if you when you meet that person you let me know everyone in chat's hands have raised <laughs> um and you know, since we're we're catching up to Joe Rogan as far as the number of listeners that we have, is what what can they do? What can the average person, a, a spouse, a family member, uh, the the PFRs themselves? What, what do you think that they should do? I think uh, going back to what I just said, we need to find true believers in the concept of federalism and a limited federal government, and we need to press the point that this is a federalization. And we're going to be funding these long term, either either state or local level. We're going to be having to pay the bill for this. And we didn't we're not our, our citizens are not getting to vote on this through our elected officials because it's the big old federal government 
that's jamming this down our throat and remind them that you said when you campaigned that you believed in limited government and I'm holding you to it. That's the best thing that I can think of that, that, that I've come up with so far is to call these people out of their hypocrisy. Oh, hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. I really like, I really like that. Uh, I really like that. Uh, you know, if I, if I can get here fast enough, uh, Lester, that's it, right? Less, less dramatic, yes. For you to come back and call bigots my admirers is a farce, it's an act of hypocrisy, it's, it's, yeah. it's a terrible way to treat a guest on your show, and you know it. How about that? I was able to pull that up with almost no cue. <laughs> oh, he, was, he was quite a character for those of you who don't know who he was. He was elected in, in 1966 to be the governor of Georgia in an in a, in a election that was tossed into the House of Representatives because there, there was no clear majority. And the, and the Democratic-controlled House elected him of the three candidates to be governor. And, that's, uh, and, and he was an avowed racist. And he ended up being governor of Georgia. And then he was proud of the Dick Cavett show, uh, how much he had done for black people. And that's where that came from. Because he said, well, if you're doing so much for black people, <laughs> what do you, how, how does that impact your admirers? <laughs> <sighs> I, don't even, I don't even have anything to, to, to bat around after that one. Uh, is there anything else? And I had, I had a question and then it just sort of like was like a butterfly and flapped its little wings and went away. I don't have anything else. I don't think for the rest of that. Is there anything else that we should touch on that AWA segment before we gallivant on? Well, we're hoping uh, the, there's a collaboration underway with uh, multi organiz- uh, multiple organizations. And we're hoping that there will be a cohesive, responsible comment put in the first draft has surfaced already a couple days ago yesterday the day before and i haven't had a chance to go through it but i know brenda has read it with a fine tooth comb and uh (laughs) but but we're hoping that that we can say something but remember folks the the regulations are merely a reflection of the law they it would be like the uh, uh uh the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, if you, if you pass the Clean Air or the Clean Water or the Clean Drinking Water Act or anything, uh, and you're trying to stop the pollution of, 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 of underground water, and the Congress says, do this, that's what the EPA is going to do. They're going to put forth proposed regulations if it's, if it's aimed at the, uh, at the at frackers or the oil industry or, or the mining or whatever it is, that, or, the, or even the farmers that, 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 that have those uh, huge cattle farms and you know all that stuff that get, contaminates the drinking water that, that cows sure. discharge it, it it's the will of the people is expressed through Congress that they do this so the bureaucrats who are doing what they're doing they didn't decide on the policy Congress did they're merely putting forth the framework now it can go both ways like if you had if you were to ever have a really liberal progressive Congress and a really conservative president you could have where you could have by regulatory intervention you could have you could have the executive branch trying to undermine what congress passed so therefore you could have a proposed regulatory framework to clean up the groundwater that would do absolutely nothing because the people in the the executive branch that they've appointed they would say gee we don't care for this and they could they could put forth a very weak set of proposals and then you could have the environmentalists come in screaming, saying, no, this is not what this was intended to do. It doesn't address these points. Par- and they were clearly intended to b- address these points in, in the law. It can go both ways. But we need to be showing where this has gone beyond what Congress mandated, because whether we agree with what Congress mandated or not, it's not up for debate right now. What's up for debate is how to achieve compliance. Teresa in chat asked, who are the collaborating orgs? Is that, is that public information? Who, uh, well, I, I, I don't know if it is, but I know that I'm working with Guy Hamilton Smith and with uh, okay. Tyrone and, and a couple of people. And, and I know we had a meeting with about 12 organizations uh, that showed oh, up. Cool. Uh, and and uh, I don't remember them all, but uh, okay. Narsa was represented. And, and, I mean, uh, I don't want to call anybody out that wants to remain behind the scenes, but I was just that was just a question that was posed. And I do have one final question, and hopefully you can answer it quickly so we don't drag this on for another 45 minutes. Are you ready for that question? Sure. Do you still have the same level of consternation over this? 
are you still as worried about it as you were uh, four episodes ago? Oh, I'm I'm extremely worried about it because I know exactly in my mind I shouldn't say exactly. I believe strongly that this is a result of 14 years of of, of failed attempts to achieve substantial compliance, and I believe that this is the collective wisdom of the states working with the Department of Justice, who have said this is the best way to go about it because we can we can we can do it through the back door through administrative process and i think that that's in, in, inevitable that that's going to happen and of course i would love to be wrong but uh, i think that that's that's that that's my fear is that we're going to have the states start handing out forms that were created by the smart office telling people that they that they're required to do this and and they if they do pass legislation they're going to pass some very vague over inclusive legislation saying that it's the policy of our state to substantially comply with the SORNA as defined by, by, by federal SORNA, and that our registration comply substantially with SORNA. And they'll come up with some vague language like that. And then when you, when you go back to that state and you say, I want a petition for removal, they're going to say, we can't remove you because our state's policy is to be compliant with federal SORNA and your, your offense is a tier two, and therefore you can't be removed. That's what my fear is. All right. Ready to be a part of Registry Matters? Get links at registrymatters.co. If you need to be all discreet about it, contact them by email, registrymatterscast at gmail.com. You can call or text a ransom message to 747-227-4477. Want to support Registry Matters on a monthly basis? Head to patreon.com slash registrymatters. Not ready to become a patron? Give a five-star review at Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Or tell your buddies at your treatment class about the podcast. We want to send out a big heartfelt support for those on the registry. Keep fighting. Without you, we can't succeed. You make it possible. Off we go. Um, You know, I know that someone emailed you and me with this bill that came from a, a not very reputable media outlet that and this was a, a fact check Calif- california's sb sb so that would be senate bill 145 eliminates an inequality and in sex offender registration that the uh I th- something i don't remember how it was worded exactly but it was that you know here here is lefty california legalizing homosexual relationships or something like that yeah that was you, uh, that was that was a smear campaign on the on the on the liberal Democrat legislature in California. But what is actually going on here? Well, they they didn't do anything to change the law. They just merely added the discretion for heterosexual sex to be excluded from mandatory registration rather than it being just vaginal sex with, with, with heterosexual couples. That's all they did. They gave the same discretion that is already in California law. And somehow that turned into it's being something about being a pro pedophilia legislation. Yes, well, that's typically what happens when 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 you try to do reforms. That's the vilification, and if you take a look, it's a partisan vilification. And this is not me saying that. That's what's happening. It, they're being vilified for 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 doing something, and they really didn't change the law. They just gave the gave the discretion, so there was it was no longer there was no longer the the discrimination against if uh, if it was a person over under under 18 having sex with the same sex partner who's over 18 which would be against the law but uh, but it would be a mandatory registration for the heterosexual i mean for the homosexual and it would be a discretionary registration for the heterosexual that's all it did is it made it equal okay there's a the, the article that i have is from usa today and there's a bunch of different like blocks and this is the the title of it is really you know it's about fact checking the, uh, the 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 claims of it being a pro pedophilia legislation. Uh, as I don't know that we need to stick around there for very long. I just it was kind of funny because when the person emailed it and you were like, I don't read this to be that way at all. But that's what yep. the uh, the media outlet was saying. Yep. It, I don't understand why people. Well, I do understand it because it 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 gets votes. The only reason people do things is because it works. And yep. when when the populace becomes smart enough to understand when they're being played like a Stradivarius, they'll stop doing it. This particular ED outlet, when you go look up, first of all, they're super duper biased and they don't rank very high as being a factual kind of place to go get your news. Really? 
<laughs> Does that shock you? <laughs> I'm shocked. I know. And then I guess we could hop on over to this uh, Huffington Post article. This this thing, someone emailed me, uh, like uh, said, hey, here's this article. And the, the title of it was about 39, the government just found 39 trafficked children in a double wide trailer. How is this not the biggest news story in America? And this Huffington Post article, which I know is about as far left as you could get on anything that goes through and breaks this whole thing down step by step by step. And they did research with uh, miscellaneous different experts on the subject of you know, there's several hundred thousand kids that are abducted, not, not they go missing. They are reported missing every year, but like 10 of them are actually in danger of something. You know, it's a disgruntled uh, spouse situation. They pick up the kids at the school wrong and then they get reported anyway. Uh, this goes through with a whole bunch of different talking points as far as how this article is completely misleading. Yes, and I, I, I've said the same thing. You know, we, we have uh, roughly something over 100 stranger abductions in the country each year, and it's been at that level for a long time. Now, the 100 is very significant if it's one of yours. Of course. Yeah, if, you're, if your son or daughter is abducted by a can you imagine in the united states if we were actually like four hundred thousand kids were just vanishing off the planet and yes. like where did my like, we would have some sort we wouldn't have any population growth because that would that would seriously curtail any sort of uh statistics like that and people would be losing their minds if four hundred thousand kids per year were, were vanishing uh, well and uh, they thousands do vanish but like you say they're they vanish because of their own volition or because of a, of a of a non-custodial parent or they vanish because of simply a mistake that someone thinks they're supposed to be someplace that they're not and they call the police because they can't find them and but but in terms of actually going missing where they've been abducted it's a very small number and right. i can appreciate that if it's your child although i don't have any children i could appreciate that but i'm just wondering why we don't make the same comparison what were the things that take far more children's lives than than, than abducted children? I mean, that that the tragedy of of of, uh, of Adam Walsh is, is incomprehensible. Can you imagine having a beautiful son and, and being having them decapitated like that after an abduction? I mean, but, it would be pretty uh, traumatizing. <laughs> it absolutely would be. But but that, there again, that's the saber toothed tiger. It's not like. We don't have things that uh, we have more kids dying from any number of causes that, that that we don't panic about, from guns to drownings to you name it. <laughs> to, yeah. uh, probably, probably I shouldn't say this because I know it's not true, but probably just just on Halloween. But if you counted all the kids that get hit on a typical Halloween, you know there's some serious injuries because of of, of Halloween, and and the the PFR say they should they should be spending the time on traffic enforcement rather than on uh, going door to door, checking up on the registrants. Absolutely. There is a interesting section in there talking about what the, the, the definition, I guess more like the clinical or the legal definition of trafficking means where if, uh, so you got a girl that runs away, she's got a really crappy situation at home. And so she runs away and she ends up on the street and she needs a place to stay. So she ends up having sex with someone to end up with a place to stay. That could be construed as sex trafficking because she used sex to, to, perf to get, food place to stay whatever that's when i think of sex trafficking i think of some hidden wall on a semi-trailer and they're being shuttled over to the middle east or something like that for some rich dude on a boat that's what i imagine as sex trafficking that would be that would be a, the extreme definition of it but there'd be something probably in the between where people were would uh, uh there to some extent i think pimping when they when you look at traditional prostitution with a pimp there's 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 a certain element of trafficking there but they've expanded this definition to it practically includes everything that was already a crime except they've made it a more serious crime because they've been trafficked they've been trafficked and, and it's to the point where if a college girl wants to sell her nude pictures they they want to call that trafficking because it's for profit it's a, it's a sexual thing for profit but then isn't a a centerfold model from playboy penthouse isn't that trafficking too well, well it, it 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 one step below because it's not nude i don't think they go completely nude in the in the in the so it's, it, well i'm thinking of sports illustrated which is on my dresser right now of uh, the swimsuit <laughs> issue but, 
Well, I mean, you, the swimsuit issue is, a, is what you look forward to, hey, right? Man, if you uh, man, I, I, this guy is not judging you. Not not judging. Uh, but on the on the uh, Playboy centerfold, uh, do they still publish that rag anyway? Uh, I think so, but there are other rags where there are people in the buff in them. Wouldn't that yes. then be trafficking? Well, it might not be because it's we have this thing in this country where if it's for a commercial entity, we look the other way. But if if it if it's for someone oh. who's doing it for their for their own purpose, it's different. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like that makes kind of like one hundred percent no sense. Yeah, I know, but that, that's the reality of what, what, what we do. You know, the, you, 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 I never you let consider a, it that way. Okay. Well, you let a, you let you let a storm come along and let someone raise their prices because they happen to have something, and, and yeah. their price they're price gouging. Sure. But you let you, but you let someone raise their prices because OPEC raised their prices, and it's not price gouging, and they didn't pay any more for that for that for that fuel that's in the distribution channel. So if OPEC raised their prices by twenty uh, percent overnight, all that all that fuel that's been produced is in the pipeline. That that that, that why is that not gouging? Uh, I isn't there some sort of like limit that they'll put in place? I mean, if you raise your price by some pennies, no one's going to notice. But if you raise it, if you double it, now everyone's got their pennies in a wad. Well, yeah, but but I'm just saying. But depending on who does it, we we tend to we tend to turn a blind eye depending on who does it. Uh, and, and it seems so, to be so for more mass stu- media. So so when a big porn studio puts out movies and they pay their their performers, that's not sex trafficking. But if I go around the corner and pay for something now i'm sex trafficking yes because see, you're just a peon and you 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 took advantage of the poor college girl or college guy whatever you're trying to trying to pay for you for the porn and 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 uh hefner's operation is all legit pays taxes they're regulated overseen and they, they i'll pay it's, taxes it's, on this <laughs> just I, that's this makes this actually makes no sense to me i've never under, i've never understood this angle either well, two consenting make, adults should be able to, to enter in an arrangement however they want to enter that arrangement. Uh, I don't make the rules. I just tell you what I think perceive them to be. And I've, I've perceived that the big people are, are cut a lot of slack on things that they can do that little people can't do. I do understand. Anything this, else this, uh, in, this, in here this, that caught your eye? This story was from your state, if I'm not mistaken. It was, Well, partially, that's another part of the story that is... Uh, bogus is how many states did it happen and it happened in like three or four states uh surrounding states you know kentucky i guess trying to remember which other states it was kentucky so it was uh south carolina tennessee oklahoma florida kentucky and michigan and michigan's not anywhere close to a southern state and it wasn't just one law enforcement outfit it it like the way that it's reported is there's almost nothing true about it once you peel back all the layers well it also speaks to what we need to do for for troubled teens in the way of, of comprehensive services. We really need we need places for them to turn to that have adequate funding so that they don't end up out on the street. Um, there's that a number would, of That was another a, piece of this. There's a number of people who actually would like services. I know th- there's always the saber tooth tiger that someone will bring out. They'll say, well, we offered that person services and they said no. And I get that, but that's the anomaly. That's not the norm. But they'll come out and say, well, you know, I went by and I talked to this homeless person and I, he didn't want any help. Yeah, well, I've tried that same experiment that I think uh, I've talked about, maybe to you about yes. in the last year that I that I tried to give uh, jobs to people around the office building here and they didn't take me up on it. But that you cannot conclude from one or two that that's a representation of everybody. Correct. 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 Okay. Uh, I think we can move over to some listener questions. Oh, wait, no, before we do that, we got to we gotta do the new patrons. Larry, we had three this week, which is pretty freaking outstanding. Fantastic. Did you know we got three new patrons? Fantastic. And we also got some subscribers to our, uh, to our uh, uh, transcript service. You, didn't, you haven't uh, shared those with me. So I'm going to say who the patrons are. We got a new one named Nick, and we have a returning one named Dave, and then a very generous monthly support from katie thank all of you so very much and thank you to all of our listeners and especially our patrons that help support the podcast and make it less uh odorous is that the right word odorous onerous onerous anyway arduous arduous that's the word i'm looking for to do the podcast well it is so much fun that we would do this and, and pay to get to do it ourselves sure 
<laughs> how many how many people have subscribed to just like the transcription side of things well when i say uh subscribe we we have the, there's two mechanisms to subscribe the patrons that are supporting at 15 a month can do, designate a recipient and uh, we've got we've got a few of those and i don't have the exact count and then we've got like three that have subscribed directly as a result of us reaching out in addition to the subscribers what i've been doing uh, uh, is sending out additional invites to people with a transcript a sample and with a subscription form and it says if you would like to receive this regularly you can subscribe directly and we've had some subscribe directly uh two or three subscribe directly and uh, uh, w they're paying with postage stamps which are acceptable i mentioned this last week but please send us sheets <laughs> send us a sheet or a book we don't want the loose stamps that have been torn apart and they've got frayed around the edges and we can't get the, the backing to peel off and what i end up doing with those is tossing them because the effort and time it takes to to peel the backing off is more than the stamp is worth but if you want to yeah. pay by stamps a significant cost of distributing this is postage so therefore it would just save us the postage so we welcome the stamps but please send the stamps that we want which is good clean sheet for good clean books and don't suitcase them what is the suitcasing no we're, we're not going to go into that it's a family-oriented <laughs> program and we would get taken off the air a anybody that has been in this community would know what suitcasing is and we don't uh, need to go into that well well but but yes we've we've i feel like by the end of the year we're going to have dozens more because the comments are good we've gotten we've gotten some letters and they're usually too long to read on the podcast uh john up in danbury thank you for the very kind letter that we just got yesterday from you uh eric and in, in uh, virginia same thing thank you for your kind kind words and we're looking forward to having correspondence from people we are not able to respond to everybody personally but everything that's sent to us if it's legible we do read it excellent and i would also like to point out that we have like a whole menagerie of people in the uh, live stream and the patrons are the ones that can join the live stream i appreciate all them showing up and supporting it's kind of fun to have people hanging around tossing questions at me and keeping me occupied all righty well where, where are we going next we are going to go over the question from Gregory about Facebook and SCOTUS. And you hate it when I say SCOTUS, don't you? I do. Yes. You say it's disrespectful. So I will say the Supreme Court of the United States. That's better. And what you highlighted is uh, there was a case in 2017-18 where a person challenged North Carolina law regarding uh, sex offenders, First Amendment rights, and Facebook. It was a favorable outcome, but my Facebook was deleted by some terms and use clause, blah, blah, blah. I had that page since 2010 and several irreplaceable pictures. I wrote Facebook in 2020, but received no response. Uh, and asking if you've heard of this, uh, North Carolina has a 10-year petition law that allows you to get off the registry. Uh, let's cover those in a minute. We'll, we'll do the, the Facebook part of this first. Can Facebook block our people from being on their platform? Well, the case he's talking about is the Packingham case. And the, the, the issue in Packingham was that the state of North Carolina had passed a, a complete and total ban of anyone required to register from being able to access social media, not just Facebook. And it was so broad that it eliminated so many legitimate uh, uh, resources that the, that the Supreme Court of the United States reversed the North Carolina High Court, which the North Carolina High Court had said it was okay, and it was taken to the U.S. Supreme Court, and they reversed that. But people confused that. That was not a, a, a case against Facebook. That was a case against the state of North Carolina. The state had said, you shall not access this. And that's where the First Amendment comes in. We don't have a complete right to speech on someone else's platform. You have the right to not be impeded by the government. And that was the government interfering. But you cannot command and take control of someone else's platforms. Try that on Sunday morning. Show up at your local synagogue or church or, or whatever day you worship and tell them that you have an alternate message you'd like to deliver and see if they'll turn the microphones over to you. 
Tell them you have I a right to I was thinking of speak. someone coming in here right now saying the same thing. Hey, look, I want to talk on your podcast. Uh, can you unmute me? No, I cannot. Thank yes, you very much. You have you have no such right. Now, we actually do uh, invite people that, that don't necessarily see things our way, but this is our distribution channel for what we're trying to message. And Facebook is a private company. And until it's either defined as a public utility by statute or by that evolving case law, which some people don't believe in that, that the law uh, evolves, but until that happens, Facebook can delist your account, and they did, and they've been encouraged to do that by the government when they, when they passed, I believe in 2008, I think it was the PROTECT Act, I may have that wrong, but they passed the, uh, a, a database for social media companies to have access to, and they collect all the, 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 the usernames and screen names and all this stuff from people required to register, and then those who, who, the companies who, who provide social media, they can, they can compare what they have against that federal database, and, and they, they delist those accounts. That's one way, and then people just flat out report them. They, they say that this person's on the sex offender registry, and Facebook can do that. And I will address the little final point in there. It says, I had a page since 2010 and several irreplaceable pictures. Listen, anybody who puts their only copy of a picture somewhere at one of these places, whether that's a Google or a Facebook, you are just asking for trouble. If, you know, if the only copy of your picture is on your phone and your phone gets run over by a truck, like, I, like, what are you supposed to do? You need to have multiple copies. You need to have backups and so forth. Do not trust any of these places to store your pictures. It's fine. It makes it easy to share it, but don't make that your own, only copy. Well, to a naive person like me, tell me how that can be your only copy. For it to be uploaded to Facebook, it would have to exist somewhere, right? If it's at Facebook and they delete your account, I would be willing to bet, like in this particular person's case, the picture is still there. They didn't. They like they just turned off your account. I don't know that they would have necessarily deleted it because nothing really gets deleted at this point. Uh, but for someone like you, you you have an Android phone. I know this. So use Google Photos and all of your photos would then just get uploaded to Google. There's at least two copies now. Now there's one on Google and there's one still on your phone. But you're going to eventually run out of space on your phone. Now what do you do? You need to find another way to move those pictures somewhere else as well. So, well, I was getting at, if you take the photo, if you're at, at the grocery store and, and you take a photo before you get uploaded to Facebook, it has to be somewhere. So when you, when you upload it to Facebook, would you still have it? You would, but eventually you're going to run out of space. It, it's, it is less common now, but phones in our past have had very, very limited storage. Uh, you know, four gigs, eight gigs of storage, and maybe you couldn't even put an external storage card in it. Sure. Uh, you'll run out of you'll run out of space fast. And now cameras on phones are they take gigantic, very 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 large pictures, and you will just run out of space fast if you're not careful. So, all right. Well, let's go to the second part about the ten year petition. Right. Yeah. So then he says North Carolina has a ten year petition law that allows you off the registry sooner. But I don't know how I don't know much about it. Do you? Do you assist people with innocence claims? I'm not requesting that assistance, but I may be able to refer you guys if you do. The answer to the last part is no, we do not. Uh, don't have the resources or mechanisms to pursue innocence claims. But there is a petition process currently in North Carolina, and it does work. I know of people who have gotten off, and, and it, it, is, it is still available. That could change if the regulations or adopted, it could be that North Carolina would decide that, that they're going to honor the federal uh, uh, terms of registration. Therefore, they would come in and object to any petition. They would say this would violate federal law, and they would encourage the legislature to change the law that would say that no one can be removed if it would if it would uh, if that person would have a longer period of, of registration required by federal law. So it's a danger for people uh, in in terms of whether that process will continue to exist, and if so, in what form. Hmm. Okay. Um, do you assist people? Uh, would you? I guess that's all that's. And yeah, I guess that's all that goes on in there. All right. So, so now we got another one. And, yes, we do. And uh, you actually helped me out because the the other one is an incredibly long letter. If anybody wants to see it over on the uh, the the screen share part that I have, I mean, so it's a long, long letter with a lot of compliments in it. But we have a condensed version of it. 
Yeah, and, so uh, I, who's, pulled, I, who's this I from? pulled out. I pulled out the questions. Okay, it's from, this is from Ben. Yes, and thank you, Ben, for the subscription. He he subscribed and and he said how wonderful the 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 transcripts are that he's gotten so far. All right, and he says I would like to start a new life without too much aggravation. I do not see that happening in Wisconsin. Thus, upon my release, I hope to leave Wisconsin and complete my tenure parole period elsewhere. In Wisconsin, state law requires that anyone convicted of a sexual offense be released to their county of conviction. Like so many others, I have no connection to that location any longer. What does one do? Well, and he, he raises a good point because what happened in Wisconsin was that that the as the locals set about trying to outdo themselves, you ended up with more and more places that were off limits and you had people that were that the Department of Corrections was paroling. And remember now if you if you have no post prison supervision, you can live anywhere you want to. And you would only be bound by whatever restrictions are in place by law. Uh, if 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 there's a two thousand foot restriction in a particular place or a thousand foot or five hundred, you could live there as long as you honored that. But in this case, the, the Corrections Department actually provides transition assistance, and they, they were putting people, they were uh, placing people, and you ended up having concentrations of people because of, of, of the hopscotch uh, of, pla- of places where they couldn't live. And that caused exactly what I used in our state to make sure there were no residency restrictions because you end up, you end up, with, you end up with a battle. In Wisconsin, they passed a law that, that a person who's paroled under the supervision of, of corrections department, they will they will have to go back to the county they were convicted. That is so ridiculous because you may not have any connections at that point by the time you or you're paroled. But in terms of his issue, it won't apply to him if he wants to move out of Wisconsin. They can't force him to. I shouldn't say can't. They shouldn't. <laughs> they shouldn't, and I don't believe they will force him to make parole to a Wisconsin address if he has a non-Wisconsin address, so he could apply as he gets within the zone of, of parole to another state. And he listed some states in the letter that he was interested in. Uh, thank you. If you right. look, take which, a quick. which leads to question number two. It says, my mother and brother live 70 miles from that county, as do any, uh, uh, any other relatives. I do have aunts and uncles in other states, including Kentucky, Minnesota, Missouri, and Tennessee. I've written several organizations in those states to no avail. Can I live in another state? You absolutely can. You don't have a right to, but there's a process that will allow you to. You can apply for transfer of your supervision through the interstate compact for adult offender supervision. And that would be done through your prison case worker. You can't have a relative do it for you on the outside. The state of Wisconsin is the beginning of the process and the corrections people have to do it. They will. They. I would. I would hope that they would not want to impede you leaving Wisconsin if you have viable addresses. So what you would do is make the application through through your resource at the prison. However they however they handle reentry, make that application. Unfortunately, I did some research on the fee, and Wisconsin is one of those states that charges a hefty fee. So if you were to want to apply to go to another state, it's one hundred and fifty dollars. And I don't know if they. If, if they have a waiver process for that in Wisconsin, but that would be for their for their duties of putting forth the paperwork to one of those states. So Wisconsin would be the sending state. They would send an application to Minnesota, and you would des- you would describe your address, your connections to Minnesota, and Minnesota would have 45 days from receipt of that to go out and investigate and determine if there would be anything that would preclude them from being able to f- effectively supervise you there. It could be something like what he described in the letter, like residency restrictions. They could find that it's a wonderful home, but it's too close to something that they don't allow supervised offenders to live close to. And then they would they would turn that application down. Or it could be something like when they collect the, the, the data on the people that are living there, they may find that they have felony convictions and they, don't, they wouldn't feel that would be a positive environment. It could be that the family has children, minors. It could be any number of things. You need to do your best to eliminate all the things that could exclude you because at $150 a whack, your commissary account is going to get very low very fast. <laughs> and, 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 there, and, and, the, and the sad thing is there's nobody to call. Uh, you, you don't have – he's already pointed out that he didn't receive any answer from the states. If he had right. sent, sent me that question here, we wouldn't have answered it either. 
uh, sure. a, a, we don't have the resources, and B, it would be fantastic for our advocacy efforts efforts if we if if uh, letters were produced that showing that we were trying to help import people with other out of state convictions to our state. I mean, the, the the lawmakers in Santa Fe would just be totally enamored by that. So therefore, we wouldn't have sent an answer either. So I'm telling you, in defense of the state she wrote to. A, they don't have, they're just volunteers, and B, they wouldn't write you that anyway, because the last thing they'd want would be for a copy of that to show up. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't serve well. But I'm telling you what you need to do, which is to apply, do everything you can to ascertain what would preclude them from approving you, know who you're applying to live with, make sure they haven't been convicted of something in recent years. I mean, they may have a 30-year-old conviction, but make sure they don't have any recent felony convictions. Make sure they don't have any minors. Make sure they don't live close to things that would give the supervising uh, uh, officials consternation before before you do the application. And you might very well find that you leave Wisconsin, because if I were Wisconsin, I would want to get rid of as many as I can, because if they're going to be offending, I'd rather them be offending in another state. Wouldn't you? Uh, it's Totally. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then uh, this is this is a subject that I think every time I hear the answer to this one, I feel like I have had to relearn what was said before because it gets confusing to me. So the person then asks, I do not know about other state registry restrictions, but not many can be worse than Wisconsin. What would I be facing in those states in terms of my registration requirements? You would be facing exactly what those states require no more. And it, so if you were to if you were to luckily uh, be accepted for Vermont, Vermont has no interest in what Wisconsin requires in terms of registration. So Vermont would tell you, just like if you took a car to Vermont, Vermont would tell you how much to pay for it, how often you would you would pay that bill, how you'd go about paying that bill, and when you would be exempt from paying that bill. The same thing will happen when you go to register in a new state. That state will tell you what your obligations are, and it will not have anything to do with a few exceptions, with the state that you were convicted in, if you're registering there, because you're no longer there. The the nuance about Wisconsin is that they t- t- they continue to tell you that you need to pay the hundred dollar fee. Oh, that's right. We covered that person that yeah. asked a question a few episodes back that he's still paying for something even after he's left. And, and I, I'd always get confused as fifty or hundred dollar fee, but they tell the people they send them a form, and they tell them to return the form that they need to comply. <laughs> well, that that is as silly as if you left Georgia. And you registered your car in California, and Georgia sent you a bill and said, go ahead and send your money on in. Would you send your money in? I don't think I would. I would at least question it, though. Well, well, that's the whole thing. I don't think jurisdictionally, I don't think they have a leg to stand on because you're no longer subject to Wisconsin's regulatory scheme. But So your registry obligations, now let's be clear, we're talking about your registry obligations, not your supervision obligations, but your registration obligations. They will be whatever the state determines that they are by that state standards. Your supervision is completely controlled by the sending state in terms of all that stuff follows you. If they give you 10 years of, 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 of supervision, you've got 10 years when you get to Vermont, even if Vermont would have only given you two years. If they tell you but that what you... If Vermont has, what if Vermont has longer? Doesn't make any difference you, 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 in terms of your supervision. It is, the, the supervision is determined by the state that placed you under supervision. So how long you're under supervision is totally controlled by the state that placed you under supervision. Wouldn't it be great if one state could unravel another state's sentence? Certainly, I'm just. There, there always seems to be this to me. It's a, it's complicated and confusing to me because a you have state uh, felony conviction rules. You also have then your probation supervision things, and those two could be completely in concert with each other, but they could be like have nothing to do with each other. And now you move to a different state, and you're still under supervision. So now you almost have like four sets of rules. You have probation, and then your state stuff, and then and, and from the two states, so you have four different things that you have to try and mingled together to figure out what you got to do it seems well, well it, it's not that complicated the state that put you under under supervision they have the only power to relieve you of, of that supervision to terminate it early if they give you 10 years you've got 10 years wherever you go of supervision but don't confuse it with registration it's only right. the supervision all the yep. conditions they placed on you 
as a part of your punishment, that follows you. If you've got to pay a hundred dollar monthly fine, when you go to to, the, to Vermont, you still owe that hundred dollar monthly fine because that's the part of your punishment. Right. If you were told to get counseling, that goes with you, even if Vermont doesn't require counseling. Vermont has to look at your conditions and they have to say, well, you're required to get counseling until we have determined at the discretion of this probation office. So we're going to have you be evaluated to see if you need counseling. And they, if, if it's worded in such a way that they can relieve you of, of that until the district, until the, but if it says that until the, until the termination of the court, then you would have, you would have counseling until the court relieved you. And only the court in the state that imposed it could relieve you. I, I don't understand what's confusing. <laughs> Larry, you live in this stuff. Let's let's talk about my world for a while and see how long it's not. But but no, this <laughs> but this is this is this is so simple. The state that imposes the punishment on you determines the punishment. You cannot escape your. Wouldn't it be a fantastic system if you could go to another state and escape your punishment by simply saying, "Well, they wouldn't have punished me that severely here, so therefore I get to be by your by your punishment. I got a twenty-year sentence in Wyoming, but you would only give me three here, so I've got three. Wouldn't that be a great system? What would happen if 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 it worked that way? I, uh, okay, then 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 shelve that for just a second. Georgia has a thousand-foot living restrictions. Go move to a state that doesn't have them. Do you have to f- follow those living restrictions? Well, if they're in the Georgia law, no, yeah. because the Georgia okay. law doesn't follow you. So okay. if the if the registration law in Georgia says you've got a thousand feet, we don't give a damn about that when you get to Wyoming if we don't have that. Sure. If if your conditions of supervision says you shall not live within a thousand feet of a school, and that's an order of the court, that makes it a little bit different because that's a part of your punishment. So that's a probation condition that the sending state is. Sure. But so, so what the receiving state would do in a case like that, they would they would they would notify the sending state and say, "We don't have that here. We can't enforce that here." And the sending state would get the option to remove a condition that they can't enforce. There there'd be a, a state like Massachusetts that where where I think the court has said that residence restrictions can't be imposed. If if someone had a restriction that they couldn't live within a thousand feet because of the nature of their crime, the court may have said, "We don't want you within fifteen hundred feet of, of where where children congregate and go to school." If that got to Massachusetts, they would say, "Nope, we won't be able to enforce that," and they would notify the state, "You need to remove that condition, or we can't accept this offender." But but your punishment goes with you, and and on top of that, the state that you go to, if they would have had an additional special condition that they routinely impose on an on offender of, of your nature that has an offense similar to yours. They can add a special condition. They can't change your, your, the duration of your punishment, but they can, they can add a special condition if it's consistent with how they supervise their offenders. Okay. Okay. So, so. Did you have an extra question that we were going to answer real quick? Real quickly, yes, uh, the, the, a person, uh, Eric, as a matter of fact, uh, mentioned that, that uh, he had filed a cert petition and that, uh, that the state didn't answer. They didn't file anything in response. And that's typical. They, they don't file anything in response uh, when you file a cert petition because the overwhelming odds are that the court is not going to do anything other than a one-line order saying cert petition has been denied. So, therefore, the state would be spending gobs of money filing response to something that the court has no interest in. So you cannot conclude anything from the fact that the state didn't file a response to pleading. In fact, it's strategically probably wise that they don't, because the worst thing you could do would be to be coy or cute or say something that could pique the court clerk, the law clerk's interest that reads that cert petition, and you you just wouldn't do that. So there's nothing to make of the fact that the state doesn't file a response. You'll hear when the court's interested in something, they'll direct the state to file a response, and that's when the state will file their response. Okay. I think that about wraps it up, Larry. I hope so. I think. You hope so? You're I hope done? so. We're, to we're, check on, out? we're on overtime now. Almost. Not quite. We're at 127 is what I have for time. Yep. Uh, but you can find the show over at registrymatters.co. Larry, what's the phone number? Uh, I forgot. 747-227-4477. And email is registrymatterscast at gmail.com. And... We love all of our listeners, uh, but our patrons are especially special to us. How do people uh, reach us through Patreon? Uh, very carefully on the internet. You you surf around till you find us. 
patreon.com slash registry matters 144 episodes or you don't have this i should be able to like beat you up at two o'clock in the morning larry what's the patreon address uh, patreon.com slash registry matters so, look at like there's a there's nearly 100 people in in the in the uh, chat you need to get your glasses checked because it's not quite that many it's close but not quite that many larry i appreciate it as always and uh I, th- I think I'm supposed to do something else before I do all that, aren't I? I, I am always glad to be here. And I can, I can I can I find it really quick? Nope, you don't have it. I can find it, and then I'll have to clip out things. There it is. I found it. That is why I am here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Have a great night. <laughs> Good night, everybody. You've been listening to F. Y. P.